Hi, this is Peter Schiff. This is Friday, April 24th, 2009. First of all, this is uh, the first day of the new format on my video blog. I'm actually posting the video blogs going forward directly to my YouTube channel, a tentatively named The Schiff Report. Uh, so if you want to see these videos, you can go directly to either my site or to YouTube. And for those people who have been copying my video blogs and who have been making them available on YouTube, and there's probably about a dozen different versions of each of my blogs, if they can simply link to this YouTube channel, then we can concentrate all the views uh, on, in, in one YouTube, and therefore we'll get a lot more view counts, and maybe uh, my blogs will show up on the most viewed or the most commented on YouTube, and therefore we'll get more people actually watching these, these clips than we did in the past. Anyway, a lot to talk about today. First, let me briefly talk about what's going on in the markets. You know, we had an outside week this week in the dollar. The dollar index took out last week's high and then took out last week's low and closed practically on the low of the week. I think that's a bearish technical sign. Also, look at the price of gold and the strength in the gold mining stocks. The Huey was up, I think, about 7.5% today alone. It had a very strong week. We took out some overhead resistance from the last couple of weeks. So we're really, again, looking at a potential breakout in the gold stocks and a breakdown in the dollar. Also, you know, a lot of news coming out on China. First of all, on Wednesday, Goldman Sachs upped their growth forecast for China. In fact, Goldman Sachs is forecasting that growth in the Chinese economy in 2010, that's next year, will be back up to close to 11%, 10.9%. Uh, again, very strong growth. Also, Deutsche Bank came out with a study where they're predicting that China will overtake the U.S. in terms of gross national product by early 2020s. That's much earlier than many people have been forecasting. Of course, I think even Deutsche Bank is wrong. I think China will have a higher GDP than the United States before 2020. Um, also, we found out that China has been secretly increasing its stockpile of gold bullion uh, in its reserves. Now, I don't think that should be a secret to anybody. I've been talking about the fact that I think China is buying gold and will continue to buy more gold. In fact, I think central banks all around the world are going to be increasing their holdings of gold, not decreasing their holdings, as many people believe. And I think this is very bullish for the price of gold. Maybe that's partially behind the move we saw this week. But again, gold is still only around $900. People still don't uh, you know, uh, understand the implications of central banks buying more gold, what that's going to mean for the price of gold, or why they're buying gold. Now, some of the political news uh, that came out, first of all, today we got the results of these stress tests that the government have been uh, uh, running on the banks uh, to reassure us that the banks are indeed stable. Well, first of all, the most important part of the stress tests are the assumptions that they make. This is the level of stress. And they're actually laughable. I mean, if you look at the government's stress tests, it's like they're trying to do a stress test on a bridge. And so they run a couple of gerbils on the bridge to see that uh, the, the bridge is sound. If you look at their assumptions, what did they assume for GDP growth? For 2010, next year, this is their worst case assumption. The worst case assumption is that the economy grows by 5%. GDP grows up by 5%. That's it. That's as bad as they think it could be. That's the worst case scenario. You know, here you have President Obama saying that things are so bad that we need this massive deficit spending. We need $2 trillion in deficit spending this year. We need to totally overhaul the economy because maybe we're going to get only a 5% growth in 2010. And the other crazy thing is the government says that there's only a 10% chance that things will be that bad. So they think there's a 90% chance that GDP growth will be higher than a half a percent in, in 2010. That doesn't sound like a lot of stress to me. What about home prices? Well, their assumption for home prices is that they drop by 7% in 2010. Remember, that's their worst case assumption. Nothing, it couldn't be any worse than that. Well, you know, if they're right, and if, of course, we get housing prices down by the 22%, they think they're going to decline this year, which already means that the current pace will moderate this year of the declines we've already seen. But they're assuming in a worst case scenario, home prices go back to where they were in mid-2001. 
which is still about 50% higher than they were in mid 2000, in 1996. Look, I think there's a chance that home prices can go significantly below where they were in mid 2001, yet the government thinks that that is the worst case scenario, that, that's, that it can't possibly get worse than that. If you look at their assumptions on unemployment, I think they're assuming that unemployment rises to about 10.5% as a worst case scenario by the end of 2010. Now, I agree that 10.5% unemployment is pretty bad, but it's certainly not a worst case scenario. I mean, it's not even a realistic worst case scenario. I mean, sure, I mean, they don't have to assume that real unemployment gets to 30% or 40% or even 20%. Even though that's possible, it's not likely. But certainly, if you're trying to come up with a worst case scenario, 10.5% doesn't seem to be worst case, given that it's already 8.5%, right? in early 2009, to think that it can't rise to, ten, to more than 10.5%. And also, if you look at the various assumptions, I think if unemployment does continue to rise, and even if it only rises to 10.5% by the end of 2010, I have a hard time believing that home prices will only fall by 7%, given that scenario, or that the economy will still grow, albeit at a slow pace. I think it'll still be contracting. Now also, something else we found out this week is that Ken Lewis, right, over at the CEO or the head of, um, of uh, Bank of America, apparently was pressured by Henry Paulson and Ben Bernanke not to disclose pertinent information about Merrill Lynch to Bank of America shareholders. Apparently, he wanted out of the deal. The losses at Merrill Lynch were much greater than what he had initially agreed. And he wanted to communicate that to his shareholders and encourage that they vote down this deal due to this change in circumstances. And apparently, both Henry Paulson and Ben Bernanke, and this is what uh, was, came out in an investigation in the state of New York, that they were pressured not to disclose this information. And that now New York is looking into prosecuting um, uh, the Bank of America guy for securities fraud. For violating securities rules. Well, the interesting part about it is, if he's guilty, what about Bernanke? What about Paulson? They're equally as guilty, if not more so, because they're guilty of abuse of power. They also apparently threatened that if Merrill Lynch did not go through with this deal, that there would be some management changes at Bank of America brought about by government intervention. So here you have blackmail on the part of elected officials and appointed officials uh, to force our executives to commit securities fraud. That's worse than the fraud itself. And of course, you know, what kind of nation are we living in if we're going to say that our leaders don't have to abide by the rules? We need to be a nation of laws, not a nation of men. And it's important that people in power don't abuse that power. And we need to put a stop to it. And you know, it's also the camel's nose under the tent. This is already pretty bad, but who knows where it's going to go from here if these acts go unpunished. As far as I'm concerned, there should be an indictment of, of Bernanke and Paulson. And in fact, I think they should be personally liable to shareholders of Bank of America. I don't think they should be, be able to hide behind their official capacity because I think they were acting outside their lawful capacity. They have no legal authority to blackmail um, a private, a private sector uh, individuals. They cannot force people to commit crimes, even if, in their opinion, those crimes are in the national interest. I mean, that is not the way our society is supposed to run. It'd be interesting to see if anything does come of this, if there's, there's going to be an, any kind of scandal here. But if you remember, if you go back and look at the YouTube clips, when I was on Fox Business, when this when this story first broke, I was saying on television live, I wonder what the government did to pressure Bank of America. I wonder why they're agreeing to this acquisition, because I knew that it would bankrupt the company. I knew the losses at Merrill Lynch would be huge. And if I knew it, I'm sure a Bank of America must have known it. And remember, they agreed to this whole merger on a weekend, right? So obviously there was a lot of pressure. And when the guy thought twice and wanted to back out of the deal, there was more pressure not to do it. Anyway, that's it for today. I'll be back again soon with another blog. Thanks for listening and watching.